The longer a black person, even an immigrant black person, who comes in with all of these motivations that we've been talking about, the longer that they exist in this country, the more likely the outcomes begin to mirror those who have existed in this country for a long time as well. That's a helpful point, but I think um, it still doesn't address um, whether it's because of racism necessarily, right? Because whether you are a second or third generation black person, you're still a black person. Yeah, there's only one race. Uh, I agree with that. Um, you know, we all have a, a common um, father in Adam, a common mother in, uh, in Eve. We have a common creator in God. Um, my wife and I are um, the same race. You know, uh, she's, she's white, uh, but yet if I believe that we had two different races, that would create a big problem. Um, <laughs> our kids are not going to be two different species, right? right, right, one. right. Um, you know, and, you know, um, as, as you said, historically, the, the, the term race was never used to describe physical characteristics. It was always to describe nations, tribes, ethnic groups. Uh, even, even in the Bible, um, God refers to Christians being a holy race a, or a holy nation. Um, and God boasts about there being different tribes and different, different ethnicities. Um, so I, this, this should be the one thing from critical race theory that I would agree with that. Yeah. It is a social construct. Um, so, so me being a Ghanaian, um, I know that my tribe, um, my, our, you know, my, my race in a sense would be my tribe. It would be uh, being Fonti, which is a tribal group in, um, in, in Ghana. It also be the Akan people, uh, which the Fonti uh, people are part of this mm -hmm. Akan group. Um, that would be, I suppose, my race. I wouldn't say black people are my race or I'll say Christians are my race. Um, now, of course, I understand why some people would use that, th those terms. Uh, but yet, for what the word means, um, you know, you and I, we have the same skin color, but we share, we need different, um, you know, we, we have somewhat different cultures and yeah, we have yeah, yeah. our differences. And I think um, the idea that we have one race uh, because of our skin color is, again, originally a white supremacist thinking. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, interesting to hear you say like, hey, this is like one of the few things I agree with on CRT. I think if a lot of the p opponents or people who have a problem with critical race theory actually understood the tenets of critical race theory, this is my theory, the garrison theory, <laughs> is that they wouldn't agree. I think critical race theory has a number of tenets that are incredibly agreeable, this being one of them, the idea, as you say, that there is one race, that race, as we understand it today, is socially constructed and socially upheld. It serves psychological and monetary and you know, social benefits uh, to certain groups and it denies those benefits from other groups and that's kind of at the core of our idea of race today. Um, of course, we have to always have like the caveat that like we also live in reality and like, yes, there is one race and at the same time, yes, people have for whatever reason um, that we've been kind of discussing here, uh, categorized and split people out into many different races. You know, so like we, we, we are one race, one human race, um, and I would say made in the image of God, um, as we've been saying earlier. Mm -hmm. So then since we agree that there's only one race, how does that, um, how does that fit into your perception of white identity? Um, I mean, I think that white identity is a political identity. I mean, as we were talking about the history of whiteness earlier and how people came to identify as white, it really is at its core a political identity. It, it, it designates who's in and who's out. That's at its core. That's just why many people who are considered white today had to achieve whiteness, right? Italians and Polish people, when they came to America, they were not white. And yet today we would look at an Italian or a Polish person and say like, yeah, that's just another white person, right? Because it's a political identity that's fluid and who's in and who's out has changed over time. And so white identity in many of the, in the historical sense is, um, as I've said, it's, it's, a, it's a political identity. Um, and so I don't think it necessarily has anything to do with our human raceness. 
Um, just like if you were a Democrat and I was a Republican, it wouldn't make us any less human. It would just mean that we have identified with political viewpoints that you know, maybe represent our, our beliefs, but it doesn't change our status as human beings. Um, I think this is actually one of the most optimistic parts of critical race theory and anti-racism at, at large is this belief that we can actually come together, that, that the differences we're experiencing are not insurmountable, right? Like, like these aren't the kinds of differences that mean that like you can't be, or you know, a white person can't you know, identify as who they are. They have to deny their skin color in order. No, it's really not that. It's the political implications and ideologies, the supremacist ideologies that have come down throughout history and, and are bearing down on this moment. Okay. So what would be an example of whiteness or white identity in a political form uh, today? I mean, I think that white identity is, is being wielded um, around grievances. I mean, we're, we're talking about CRT and this whole concept. Probably the reason why we're here to talk about this is because it's in the news, at least over the last year or two, it's been in the news a ton with parents at school boards protesting that quote unquote CRT is being taught in schools. It probably isn't. The academic theory of critical race theory probably isn't being taught in those schools. And yet, Christopher Rufo, you know, a political mover and shaker, decided that he wanted to make critical race theory the boogeyman and attached all white grievances to critical race theory. This idea that kids are being taught to hate themselves because they're being made uncomfortable by the very real history of what white people have done or people who identify as white, what they've done in this country. That history shouldn't make anyone hate themselves. It's just make them aware of the ways in which we can do better going forward. But white identity really demands that it be centered. It cannot be wrong. It must be perceived as superior, both morally and, and in almost every, every way. And so the, the threat of, of talking about history that casts some level of aspersion on, on white people in, in the past who've done horrific things that we should all be able to agree were horrific things. The idea that we can teach that history and that is what's harming these kids, these white kids, I think that is actually one of the implications. That's the ways in which whiteness and white supremacy is actually casting a, a very long shadow to where we are today. Um, what you said about Christopher uh, Rufo, Rufo, who yeah. actually would be a friend of mine. Uh, you know Christopher which, Rufo. Yeah, which, which is okay. <laughs> it's all right. Um, uh, don't, don't feel shy no, about no, saying anything. No, I, I don't. I only mention that because um, he and I actually do some similar work um, as well, too. So I also highlight critical race theory um, in especially can Canadian schools where uh, it is common, um, where the academic aspect has been taught, but especially, again, uh, critical race theory addressing white people as oppressors, as, um, as colonizers, and how you have to divest f um, from uh, whiteness, and you have to, you have to do allyship, and uh, teaching five-year-olds, um, you know, and I've, I've seen this, I've mentioned this, I've mentioned this on my, on my blog, where they're saying that white people are oppressive people. Um, therefore, um, some kids are coming, coming home being told, being, uh, saying to their, their parents, I don't want to be white anymore. Uh, these, these things are happening. But what I wanted to address as it, as it ties to the question of whiteness or white identity is um, you mentioned that white people like uh, Christopher who are um, highlighting critical race theory, and I don't think they're addressing the history uh, at all. I think they're addressing the real issues within critical race theory. Uh, but my concern there is um, what about black people like me who have the same views uh, that Christopher Rufo has, would that be white identity? It's hard, to, it's hard for me to say. It's hard for me to really answer that question. I think there kind of are a mixture of terms here that make it difficult for me to say like yes or no. What I will say is that, do I think that non-white people, which maybe is kind of the heart of the question, do I think that non-white people can work on behalf of the interests of white supremacy? Yes, I do, I do think that. Um, so I appreciate your honesty there. Um, so the reason why I mention that is because if Christopher Rufo or white people like him are addressing this issue because they want to protect whiteness uh, in their mind, then the implication would be then people like myself who agree 
uh, with someone like a Christopher Rufo would then also be trying to protect whiteness as well. How do you, do you, I guess my question is, is do you feel as though, or would you identify yourself as, as working on behalf of the interests of white identity? Of course not. <laughs> I would say that I'm working on the interest of um, one, agreeing with the word of God, um, agreeing that um, critical race theory is, is incompatible with Christianity. Uh, its principles are, are, are different uh, from what the Bible uh, teaches. But no, I'm also concerned about, you know, um, I was raised in, um, again, a fatherless home, and uh, I saw that had effect, how, how that affected me. And critical race theory does not address that, those issues whatsoever. It demonizes white people, and it suggests that even me as a black man, that if I don't agree with critical race theory, then I'm a white supremacist, or that I'm embracing or internalizing racism. Uh, I think that's wrong. And I think um, if, it's, if it's wrong for someone to suggest that I am, uh, by virtue of disagreeing with, with critical race theory, that if I am trying to protect white supremacy, then it's also wrong to assume that of white people as well. Because if someone wouldn't say that I'm being racist um, because, well, I'm black, then the issue is then they're showing partiality or racism against white people who think the same way as I do. Hey friends, Greg here with Honest Discourse. We hope that you're enjoying this conversation. We are so excited for it to continue. But first, a brief message from our sponsor. Hey friends, Pastor Matt here with Central Church. This episode of Honest Discourse is brought to you by Central Church in Collierville, Tennessee. You know, Central Church got behind this discussion because we really believe that this is what our world needs more of. We desperately need more understanding, more loving conversations with Christ at the center. And Central Church is a Bible teaching, Bible believing church in Collierville, Tennessee. We exist to multiply and to mature disciples of Jesus Christ, to produce Christ-centered relationships. And so we want to just put that offer out to you. If you're ever in the area, we sure would love to meet you. Drop by Collierville, Tennessee, and see what God is doing at Central Church. God bless. Hope to meet you in person. A huge thank you to Central Church for sponsoring this episode. Now back to the conversation. There is an unbalanced distribution of power, wealth, and education that is racially motivated. I would say yes to this. I think this is a statement from my perspective of a fact, um, both historically and uh, contemporarily, that there is a, you know, we, we spend thousands more dollars in America on white students than we do on black and brown students. Um, that for me is a, is a disproportionate dis distribution or however the question goes, right? It's, it's, it's not right. And I think it's fixable, um, but we'd have to assess, we'd have to measure, we'd have to be aware of the history, as I've said many times, that bring us to this moment, the ways in which our education system from the very beginning was designed to either fully exclude or to only give a second class education to non-white children. Um, and the ways in which we've made progress have been on the heels of, of great fight and debate and push for change. And I think that push for change needs to continue. Okay. Um, I would disagree with that, uh, um, of course. And I would uh, actually disagree with what you said about black students receiving less uh, funding than white students. Actually, the Urban Institute, um, they had a study, um, I think a year or two ago, where they, um, they proved that that's actually a myth, it's not true. Uh, I think the average, uh, I think generally the average uh, black student receives about 20,000, uh, you know, per student, uh, $20,000 uh, in funding um, for their education. Um, and that's true for the white students as well, too. So um, that actually is a myth, so I would disagree with that. But I think you know, as someone who uh, grew up, so I'm actually a high school dropout. Um, I, um, and you know, that's unfortunately not too common with uh, fatherless, uh, sorry, that's not too uncommon with fatherless children. Um, that is, uh, I'm forgetting the exact number, but I think children who are fatherless are significantly more likely, I think it's about five times more likely to not graduate from high school. And that's um, for both white students, Latino students, brown students, black students. Um, that is the real issue here. Uh, I think uh, when, when you have black students who are uh, receiving the same funding as uh, black students who are, um, who are uh, fatherless, these black students who are receiving the same funding who have both parents in the home 
they do significantly better. I think that's the real issue. And I think uh, if we address that, you have more uh, students, uh, black students who will graduate from high school and do better educationally. Uh, but I think also, you know, you mentioned history and um, we, we can't ignore uh, what history, um, uh, you know, has, how it's affected black people in America and also in Canada. Um, but the problem is, you know, I mentioned Canada. Canada has a different history uh, than Americans in, in terms of the severity of white supremacy. We had slavery, we had segregation as well, but it wasn't as, um, as wide or as severe as America. And yet, and yet the uh, outcomes, the disparities are identical as well. And I think the only common denominator, the only thing that is similar that would lead to these outcomes is a fatherlessness issue. So I don't think we can point to America's history as being the primary reason. But then when we also mention it's racially motivated, um, you know, you mentioned that you believe it is, but then your um, seemingly, um, your evidence for this, you said it's a fact, but then your evidence for, uh, for the unbalance of power uh, in education and in wealth, um, the evidence for that you mentioned um, is just disparities, but I think it's unhelpful. So for example, uh, being a West African uh, immigrant, um, you know that West African immigrants are actually outperforming white students. Asian Americans are performing white students. Um, a lot of immigrants, a lot of non-white immigrants, uh, or including people who were born in America are outperforming white students. So if it's because of, um, if it's because of racism, um, that, 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 those facts, I think, uh, would disprove that claim. Well, I think, Couple of things. I certainly want to like take a look at the data that you're talking about. I wish we were in an environment where we could like do fact checks and all that stuff. That'd be really helpful right now, but we can't, right? And so I have a set of beliefs that you've called a myth, and you have a set of beliefs that you're saying, hey, actually, I have disputes, and there's no way for me to like fact check that right now. So I'll take your word for it. Okay. So we'll we'll move from there on good faith. What I will say is like you, at, at your last point that you just made about being an immigrant. I think there are a number of studies I can say that I have read these studies that talk about the self-selecting nature of immigration. The fact that the people who choose to leave their homes, their homeland, the comfort of where they are, where they know people and are, have their families, and choose to go to a different country for the express purpose of giving their children a better life or seeking opportunity for themselves, there is a very specific set of psychological um, strength, some grit there that would lead a person to do that, grit that I absolutely admire. And so it's not surprising that the children of those kinds of people, or even just those people themselves, would outperform um, those who are kind of just like living their everyday lives in the country that they were born in and, and trying to do their thing. They weren't motivated by the desire to, to get out of their comfort zone to achieve. And so I think it's in some ways a little unfair to make that comparison, frankly, um, because of the nature of those people. I actually, my wife is, is from Barbados, so her family immigrated here from the Caribbean. And those people came here and decided, we're going to accomplish some stuff, all right? Both of my in-laws have doctoral degrees. Uh, my wife and her brother both have doctoral degrees. They are an incredibly accomplished family. And I think it's directly related to that internal motivation that can't really be uh, quantified by the entirety of a group. Because as you are aware, your accomplishments or the, the grit and the ability of, of other immigrant people who've done well in America would not be the fairest comparison to all the people who are still in Ghana, right? Or all the people who are still in the Caribbean. Um, it just wouldn't be a, a fair comparison. So I think that's important to acknowledge here. To your, please, please, yeah. Yeah, I really actually appreciate that, those points. I think you made some fantastic points and something that I need to consider more as well too. Uh, but yet I will say that your argument, I think actually hurts um, the original argument that this is racially motivated because as you said, there are other factors that lead to why some black people are, 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 are doing better than others. So if racism is the issue, then even though, as you said, that these people are, uh, these some you know, immigrants are more motivated because of um, just, uh, as you mentioned, that the immigration process is more selective and they're coming here with extra motivation, well then they're still facing racism and yet they're able to overcome it. So I think um, if, if you're saying that it's the system is against them as well too, but yet they're thriving despite the system. I think that actually goes against your original point. 
So I, I appreciate you kind of bringing in this, bringing in this point of clarification. Um, I actually think, so there's a reparations hearing um, back on June 19th, 2019. I was there in the room where Tiny Hesey Coates referenced um, an academic study that talked about the African-Americanization of black immigrants to this country um, in the third, second and third generation. So once an immigrant comes here, they typically accomplish great things. Their children typically accomplish great things. But it's that next generation and the one after that ends up mirroring the almost exact same uh, metrics and accomplishments of African-American people here in this country. I wish I had it to just like reference and give it to you. But anecdotally, how about, how about that? We'll, we'll, just, we'll talk about this, this study anecdotally. Uh, the longer a black person, even an immigrant black person who comes in with all of these motivations that we've been talking about, the longer that they exist in this country, the more likely the outcomes begin to mirror those who have existed in this country for a long time as well. Yeah, that's a helpful point, but I think um, it still doesn't address um, whether it's because of racism necessarily, right? Because whether you are second or third generation black person, you're still a black person. This is a really important point. It's actually something that comes up in critical race theory, which you would disagree with. But, but critical race theory, one of the six tenets of critical race theory is this idea of differential racialization, that different racial groups are racialized in different ways. And we can dig deep into that differential racialization on a level that I think would um, maybe bridge the gap between our conversation. I mean, you think about the way that black people are racialized in America, but the way that an African-American is racialized, those stereotypes don't exist in the same way for Nigerians. They don't exist in the same way for Jamaicans, right, as an African-American. The, the way a Korean is racialized in America is actually slightly different than the way a Filipino per person is racialized in America. And so this differential racialization is actually an invitation to analyze the ways in which race is like a, a moving goalpost and, and, and the ideas of race are moving. And so what we're talking about does not actually preclude or, or exist outside of critical race theory. It's actually a robust discussion within critical race theory of the exact same thing that, that, you're, that, that we're discussing here. <laughs>